welcome to Eggs and Issues, a monthly business program presented by the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce. Listen weekday mornings to Ken and Matt on the WGAN Morning News. Eggs and Issues is supported by presenting sponsors, Bank of America, Martins Point Healthcare, and Unum, in cooperation with Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, Oxford Networks, and WEX. And now, please welcome Portland Community Chamber of Commerce President, Jack Lufkin. Good morning, everyone. All kinds of uh, all kinds of buzz in the room. It's like we almost have a celebrity here uh, today. So my name is Jack Lufkin. I work for Key Bank, and I'm the volunteer president of the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce. And I want to welcome you to Eggs and Issues. Uh, the first thing I want to do is uh, is, uh, is is thanks uh, to our Portland Sea Dogs for helping us arrange for today's speaker, and in particular Dennis Meehan, who uh, was very instrumental in in uh, putting this all together. So. <clears throat> so today's presentation, uh, obviously, uh, generated quite a buzz. Uh, we will be uh, hearing from uh, Sam Kennedy, our guest speaker on the stage in, in just a couple of minutes. And uh, it's been suggested that maybe we're gonna get some inside info on who they're about to sign up or something. And just, you know, if you wanted to, that's, so, you know, that's fine. So, <laughs> one other item of note, uh, this upcoming year for our Portland Sea Dogs is going to be their 25th year in Portland. So. <laughs> so, before we do get to the program, I do want to take a moment and, uh, and tell you about a few things that are coming up through the Portland Regional Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we are going to have our annual event and celebration uh, that's going to be happening very soon. Last year, we had approximately 700 people gather at the Portland Company Complex uh, for a celebration of our region, as well as um, our, our celebrating our annual award recipients. This year, we're hoping for our largest gathering, and we're going to host it at uh, Brick South on Thompson's Point, a fantastic venue if you haven't uh, yet been there. Uh, that's going to happen on January 24th. Uh, there'll be a night of food, fun, drinks, and music. Meet with old friends and new, and join us as we celebrate what our region is and what it can be in the future. Uh, we hope you'll join us at Brick South, and uh, you can keep an eye out for a formal invitation. But in the meantime, the registration is open on the Chamber's website. Uh, a couple of other uh, exciting things that are happening next week, M uh, Monday we will have our second Kegs and Issues with uh, MC Melissa Smith of WEX uh, is going to be our MC. <laughs> Sorry, you get the eggs. Yeah, yeah. So you can come back. You can always come back. Uh, Melissa Smith of WEX is going to be emceeing the event, and uh, Ann Heros of the Center for the Grieving Children will provide some of the remarks for that. Uh, it's Monday from 4.30 to 6.30. And it's going to be hosted at Aura. And again, uh, major investment to that facility, uh, not to be missed. So please do uh, sign up for that. And we're going to be graced by the Xander Nelson Band following the presentation. Next Tuesday, the Women of the Chamber event at the Victoria Mansion has been sold out. Uh, however, if you'd like to be put on a cancellation list, please contact the Chamber staff for that. Just a, a fantastic venue. So. Uh, finally, next Thursday, we're hosting an Experience Greater Portland at the Cross Insurance Arena. Many of you attended this last year, and you can speak to what a great program this is. The event is from 5 to 7. It's free to attend, and you can sign up also at the Chamber's website. Now, we wouldn't be here today without the generous uh, support of our sponsors, so I'd like to take just a moment to thank them. Our presenting sponsors are Bank of America, Martins Point Healthcare, Unum. Our cooperating sponsors are Hill Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, WEX, and First Light. Our reception sponsors, Clark Insurance, Key Bank, and our parking sponsor, CV and Mahar Engineers. Headlight Audio Visual provides us with our overall production support, and we thank the, their staff for doing a fantastic job with that. Uh, the Forecaster is our print sponsor, and Main Biz is our e-media partner. WGAN is our radio sponsor who interviews our speakers and broadcasts live right here every month. 
WMTW-TV serves as our broadcast partner. And we'd also like to thank our special community partners, Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Spectrum Healthcare, Oxford Casino, the University of Southern Maine and Southern Maine Community College. AAA of Northern New England and Springborn Staffing support our Tomorrow's Leaders and Entrepreneurs program, which allows area high school and college students to attend eggs and issues. This month, yeah, excuse me, this month we have students from Southern Maine Community College, Chevers, and Greeley High School. If you're in the audience, would you mind standing so we can recognize you? Thank you for coming. <clears throat> this month is exciting because uh, I'm about to announce something that was just kind of an idea that happened at the conclusion of last month's Eggs and Issues. We are very pleased to announce a new partnership starting today with the Portland Public Library, which will serve as our FMI sponsor for more, for more information. Uh, with Eggs and Issues, timely, fascinating, and sometimes provocative speakers each month, the library will provide a few follow-up links and other resources after each event. For those who want to learn more about the topic, William Bandona, I hope I said that correctly, Portland Public Library's Cracker Jack business, haha, <laughs> Cracker Jack, business and, uh, and government librarian will assist, uh, he assists business owners with their information needs using the most reliable and relevant resources. So be on the lookout for more information about this event and our new partnership. It's going to be an interesting. Uh, I do also want to take a minute to uh, uh, thank Baker Newman and Noyes, who sponsors our Community Corner program, which allows area nonprofits to promote their organizations at Eggs and Issues. This month, we're highlighting Portland Masonic. The Portland Masonic, a historical landmark located in downtown Portland, built in 1911, offers one-of-a-kind space for those looking to host both intimate and large special events, holiday party and parties, weddings, or corporate meetings. Over the last five years, with the help of their exclusive catering partner, Blue Elephant Events and Catering, and Spirits Catering, the Portland Masonic has hosted a plethora of events and weddings. The Portland Press Herald says, the Portland Masonic has some of the most magnificent interior spaces in Maine, while the Bollard calls the Portland Masonic an architectural mar marvel hidden in plain sight. The first floor and limited space on the second floor are available for rent and features period millwork, original Tiffany stained glass windows, antique crystal chandeliers, and extensive use of scagliolo, help, scagliola. I knew that, I just was <laughs> testing you. Scagliola, which is a 17th century plaster technique producing marble-like finish on walls. This technique can also be found in other places such as Buckingham Palace. Uh, as a 501c3 nonprofit, all event bookings are applied directly to the Portland Masonic Building Restoration Fund, assisting with the many ongoing restoration efforts within the building, eventually allowing all six floors of the Portland Masonic to be open for public use. With us today from Portland Masonic are Angela Fall, General Sales and Event Manager, Rachel Davis, Event Sales Coordinator, Jerry Milroy, Portland Masonic Trustee, and John Crowley. Thank you, and let's congratulate them. An important part of uh, Eggs and Issues each month, and really the lifeblood of the Chamber, is our new and returning uh, uh, membership. And this month, we'd like to really uh, highlight and welcome uh, those companies that are new to the, uh, the chamber. And if anyone is in attendance from any of those companies, please stand up and at the conclusion we can uh, give you a round of applause. Uh, new uh, members, Adelphia Consults, CarMax, Colby Company LLC, Gateway Community Services, Holding Hands Home Healthcare LLC, Maine Business Immigration Coalition, Mast Landing Brewing Company, Moose Ridge Associates, Priority Learning, and the Francis Hotel. Welcome to the Chamber, and we greatly appreciate your membership in our organization and look forward to working alongside you in the month and years to come. So, thank you. Now, for the reason we are all came here today, let's get on to the presentation. As a reminder, 
There will be a Q&A session after uh, Sam has a chance to uh, give us his thoughts. Uh, I do ask that people go to the microphones. We have now three set up around, around the room. We do ask that you um, I, you know, say your name and what organization you're with. You can also um, tweet a question using the hashtag eggs and issues if you'd like to do so. Uh, Sam Kennedy became president of the Boston Red Sox on October 16th, 2015, succeeding president and CEO emeritus Larry Lacchino. And then he was elevated to CEO in August of 2017. As president, Kennedy has oversaw the clubs and its, over, and its operations. A native of Brookline, Mass., Kennedy grew up within walking distance of Fenway Park. Kennedy, who was classmates at Brookline High School with former Red Sox manager and current Chicago Cubs president of baseball operations, Theo Epstein. I wonder who put that in our notes there. Maybe our resident <laughs> Cubs fan, Quincy. So, uh, grew up with Theo and began his career in baseball in 1993 when he was an intern in the ticket department of the New York Yankees. Ooh. <laughs> In 1996, he was hired by his mentor, Larry Lacchino, at the San Diego Padres. In 2002, Kennedy joined the Red Sox as vice president of corporate partnerships. And in 2004, Kennedy helped create Fenway Sports Management, formerly Fenway Sports Group, which has emerged as one of the most well-respected and international sports sales representation agencies in its 11-year history. In addition to his Red Sox role, Kennedy is also president and CEO of Fenway Sports Management. It is well worth mentioning that Sam currently serves on the board of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. And without further ado, welcome to the stage, Sam Kennedy. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jack. Um, I guess you were gonna get out from behind the pulpit here. Um, my friend Al Martin, who's over here on the left, knows my father, who's an Episcopal clergyman. So I've spent most of my time trying to get away from pulpits <laughs> and having more of kind of an informal chat. So the word keynote uh, intimidates me a little bit. Uh, but Jack, thank you very much. We were chatting at the table. I, I've come to find out you are, without question, the most valued and respected member of the Portland Chamber of Commerce in your particular price range. So <laughs> con congratulations for that, and uh, that is a, a, some accomplishment. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody, and, and welcome. It, it's a, uh, an honor and a privilege to be here uh, this morning. Uh, I was saying to my wife on the way up here last night, some people come to Portland in July and August and stay on the coast with the beautiful views. I come up in the middle of December in a driving rainstorm. Uh, but it is, it is great to be here uh, in the great state of Maine. We are so blessed at the Red Sox to have uh, an incredible geography. We've got this six state region with incredible Red Sox fans. Uh, but our time in Boston has really been defined uh, by relationships uh, and partnerships. Um, as you heard in the bio, I started my career with the Yankees and then I went to the San Diego Padres and came back to Boston with Larry Lucchino and Theo Epstein and a few other colleagues in 2002. Um, and we have been so fortunate uh, to develop uh, one of the uh, most important relationships uh, in, in our 16 year history uh, here, right here in Portland, Maine uh, with the Burke family. Uh, so I wanna thank uh, everyone uh, from the Portland Sea Dogs, there's nothing more important to the, uh, the success and operation of the Boston Red Sox than our minor league affiliate network. Um, and Bill and Sally and Mike and Jeff have been just incredible partners. Charlie Eschbach, of course, along the way. Um, you guys have been amazing. In fact, when I was leaving the office yesterday, I said to Ben Crockett, our farm director, I said, Ben, gun to your head, who is our best affiliate of the five affiliates we have? He said, Portland. I said, that doesn't say much about us because we actually own and operate two of the other affiliates. <laughs> he said, sorry, boss, that's the truth. They treat us a lot better than we treat ourselves. Uh, so guys, thank you so much for all you do for the players in the front office, thank you. 
So there's a, a, a lot going on in the world, and, and you all uh, work in what I like to call the, the, the real world. Um, I am fortunate enough to work in, in professional baseball and sports, the toy department of life. Uh, so I thought this morning that we should just take a breath, take a step out of Fox News and MSNBC and the dailiness of the businesses that you all own and operate and work in uh, and have a little bit of fun this morning. Um, so hopefully, does anyone want to have fun out there? All right, good. We're going to have some fun. We're going to talk a little bit about baseball, the business of baseball, um, how we operate the club. I'll try to be relatively brief in my remarks, and then we'll get uh, to the famous eggs and issues uh, question and answer uh, section. By the way, the, the Q&A for kegs and issues is probably a lot more fun. So I am looking forward to coming back for that uh, session. That'll be a good one. Uh, but there's a, little, there's a little hook here because sometimes you go out and you speak in public and it's amazing. You, you guys do this in your careers. People get shy and they get a little bit intimidated by uh, asking the chance to get up and ask a question. So I'm here with my colleagues, uh, Carter Spears and Jamie Doran, who are going to help me out. Uh, and we are actually going to bribe you to get up and ask a question. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, if you're bold enough to get up and ask a question, you're going to receive a gift from the Boston Red Sox. Pretty good, right? There is a catch. The, the quality and type of gift that you receive is going to be directly correlated to the tone and tenor of your question. So this is a smart group, a very smart group. But let me, let me just take that a step further. Um, if you want to ask me what it's been like to have been a part of the Red Sox organization since 2002 and join this great affiliation with the Burke family and the Sea Dogs and in an era where you've won three World Series championships, um, we might have a David Ortiz signed baseball for you. If you want to ask me why we have the highest ticket prices in all of baseball, <laughs> or if you want to ask me about David Price and Dennis Eckersley, well, Carter might have a keychain for you. <laughs> so you can decide what type of question you want to ask. Start, I, I put that on the table now so you can start to think about it and really give it some thought. Um, we are, unfortunately, I see cameras in the back, I heard something about tweeting, so I get we're not entirely off the record, uh, but I don't see Dan Shaughnessy here. I don't see Kirk Minahan here. I don't see Michael Felger here. I don't see Steve Buckley here. So we can be just about off the record and have a real conversation this morning uh, about the Red Sox. And I look forward to your, your questions and uh, providing you uh, with some insight, if possible. Well, let's dive in and get started. Um, uh, I, I thought it would be helpful to sort of set the mood. Here we are, it's December uh, 2017. Uh, the hot stove is uh, about to uh, get a lot hotter, I would anticipate, now that the uh, Shohei Otani uh, discussion, at least for the Red Sox, is over. Uh, and it looks like Stanton is probably going to end up somewhere else. I think those two uh, uh, players will cause the market to move a little bit. Uh, now as we, we move forward into December. Uh, but I thought I'd set the mood uh, by starting off with a brief video uh, just to kind of uh, level set the, uh, the conversation, which is going to involve Fenway Park and, and the Boston Red Sox. So I, I think our video productions folks like to include the shot of Fenway Big Air, the ski jumping and snowboarding we did, because that was, in my 16 years, that was the closest I ever came to getting fired uh, by John Henry, Tom Werner. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm only half kidding. Uh, it, it was actually an unbelievable event. As I see that 140-foot ramp being erected in center field, I still can't believe we did that. But it was a, a great event. We had a lot of millennials that came to the ballpark. And uh, it was uh, wild to do something in February of, uh, of uh, 2016. Uh, I thought, given this was a, a business group, that uh, you all, before we get into some of the baseball, I thought it would be helpful 
uh, just to give an, a, an overview uh, of who we are as a company. Uh, after all, uh, I mentioned we are in the, the toy department of life, but after all, we are a, a business. Um, many of you uh, are familiar uh, with some of our investors and our owners. We have a great connection to the state of Maine through the Alphon family. Uh, Bill and Ted Alphon and their family are investors in our parent company, which is Fenway Sports Group, uh, FSG as we call it. You can see the uh, holdings underneath FSG, which include the Red Sox and the real estate associated with Fenway um, and Nesson, New England Sports Network, which is our regional sports net, the home of the Bruins and the Red Sox were distributed in about 4.4 million households throughout the New England states and around the country on Nesson National. Those were the three assets that our group acquired back in the uh, uh, winter of 2001 going into 2002. Uh, since that time, uh, we've, uh, through some entrepreneurial uh, vision of, of John and Tom and their partners, we've grown to expand into new and different businesses within FSG, uh, including the sales and marketing business through through Fenway Sports Management. Uh, we've been uh, acquiring real estate parcels and, and now uh, getting into the real estate development uh, business uh, in Boston and in Southwest Florida in our spring training facility, uh, which we can talk about if there's any questions there. 2007, we acquired another uh, professional sports team, uh, Roush Racing, which was uh, at the time America's largest NASCAR team. Uh, we rebranded that business, Roush Fenway Racing. Uh, that's it's a 50% partnership with Jack Roush. Uh, he handles the, the engineering um, and the on-track activities, and we help support with the sponsorship and, and marketing and, and revenue creation for the business. Uh, and then in 2010, hard to believe, uh, almost eight years ago, uh, we made our largest acquisition, believe it or not, even bigger than the Red Sox uh, acquisition in, in 2001. And that was a 100% acquisition of Liverpool Football Club uh, over in England. Liverpool is a Premier League soccer team uh, with a worldwide fan base. Uh, and if you cobble all those assets together, uh, Fenway Sports Group uh, has uh, well over a billion dollars in, in top line revenue, uh, about 1,200 employees located in Boston and Florida, North Carolina, Liverpool, London. Um, so we, we have a, a, a diversified sports and entertainment company uh, that started with the acquisition of the Red Sox and Fenway Park back in 2002, but it's expanded uh, through the, the vision uh, and the hard work of, of the 16, 17 uh, owners and investors uh, that are led by John Henry and Tom Werner. They're the managers of the partnership that, that own and operate those different businesses, and all of us that work for the different companies report up to them. But it's an exciting company. We're always looking for new and different uh, opportunities. Uh, we are in the minor league baseball business as well. I mentioned uh, we have an ownership interest in Pawtucket, our AAA team uh, in Rhode Island. Uh, that's a limited uh, minority share. Uh, we have a controlling interest uh, in our single A affiliate uh, in Salem, Virginia. Uh, and I, I wasn't kidding when I said Portland uh, is the favorite affiliate of our uh, baseball operations team. So we have some work to do, uh, Bill, back uh, on the home front. But that's a little bit uh, a look at, at kind of who we are. Obviously today we're here to talk about the Boston Red Sox and Fenway Park. Um, so I thought I'd give you just a, a quick overview of how we think uh, each and every day about, about operating uh, the franchise. Um, it, it, it really breaks down uh, into three areas. Uh, and I think if we're, we're focused on each of these areas each and every day, uh, hopefully uh, we'll be doing our jobs and, and we can uh, look ourselves and look our fans, look our business partners in the mirror uh, and, and let them know that uh, we're doing everything we possibly can. First and foremost, we have to be an organization uh, about winning. Um, if you're not in professional sports to win, uh, you should get out. Uh, winning uh, is, someone once said, it's, it's not uh, everything, it's the only thing. Uh, it is true. We, we must approach uh, the market. We're one of 30 competitors. It's getting harder and harder each and every year. But John Henry, Tom Werner, 
want to win baseball games each and every year, put us in a position to be in the postseason, uh, and then hopefully go on and win uh, more World Series championships. That's obviously uh, harder uh, said than done, but that is what drives us. Um, this group of, of owners and investors have been very successful in other walks of life. Uh, they do not spend their time operating these sports and entertainment assets uh, for cash flow or asset appreciation. That will come if you do a good job. Uh, they run these businesses to win on the field, win on the pitch, win on the track, uh, and the re and starts and ends with the Red Sox. In our time, uh, we've been here, as I mentioned, 16 years. We've been to the postseason nine times. Uh, we've won three World Series championships. I can tell you that passion uh, and hunger uh, to win again and again and again is there. Uh, we recognize we may not win the World Series every year. It's, it's difficult, uh, but we certainly have that as a goal to play baseball in October uh, each and every year. And in our time, uh, we've had some, some high highs and low lows, uh, but the commitment and the effort, whether it's through the draft, scouting and player development, working with our affiliates, uh, working in the international markets, uh, engaging in free agency, engaging in creative trades, whatever we can do to improve the club each and every year, we feel an obligation to try and do it uh, so we can play baseball deep into October. So that's number one. And if you talk to the 330 men and women that work at the Boston Red Sox, I think they'll, they feel that commitment to winning. It's there each and every day uh, as you walk around the ballpark. Second, uh, we want to do everything we can, and this was a, a point of distinction uh, for the, the Henry Werner uh, group when they came in in 2001. We want to do everything we can to preserve, protect, enhance, uh, and really save Fenway Park. Um, for those of you who weren't uh, in and around the Boston area back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, there was a lot of discussion. What is going to happen to Fenway? Uh, should it be torn down, build a new location on the waterfront, build a new Fenway in the Fenway neighborhood? Uh, when we came in, um, and, and the credit for this goes to, to Larry Lucchino, my mentor, and a brilliant um, design architect, a woman named Janet Marie Smith, who had been the, uh, Larry's partner in crime on, on Camden Yards in Baltimore and then uh, on Petco Park during our San Diego days. They had the vision that Fenway uh, just needs some TLC. It needs to be uh, renovated, uh, it can be expanded, uh, and it can be modernized. Uh, to meet the needs of the modern fan, and it could also be expanded to, to host some new and different events, which you uh, clearly saw in the video uh, there. We have an affirmative goal to establish Fenway as the preeminent uh, outdoor live uh, entertainment uh, a venue and facility in New England. Um, it's, it's, we're sometimes a little bit challenged with the weather, uh, but uh, we try to uh, bring in events that can uh, keep energy and life in the ballpark all year round, uh, given we've made these massive investments since 2002 to save Fenway. Uh, and we partnered with Marty Walsh and, and the, his team at the city of Boston to bring in football and hockey and concerts and outdoor ice hockey and skiing and snowboarding and uh, Irish hurling, all these uh, different events that, um, that consumers want to see. Uh, of course, baseball is always the priority, uh, but our investment into Fenway uh, since 2002 uh, has been about $325 million uh, of our partner's money uh, into Fenway Park, uh, and it was a, a staged process. Uh, we thought it was going to be a 10-year plan. Uh, we're now on year 16. Uh, you realize that when you have a, a building that's over 100 years old, there's a lot of capex needed. Uh, there's different uh, opportunities to create more revenue, to create fan uh, areas, uh, to try and, and expand uh, the footprint. The first major thing we did was back in 2002 when we actually closed down Yawkey Way for games and, and created a fan uh, a concourse out there, pregame and in-game. Fenway need, uh, needed and still needs more breathing room. We have about 424,000 square feet at, at the ballpark. Most ballparks are over a million square feet. So we're very, very small, uh, and then that's the trade-off you get for being in uh, an incredible urban location. Some of the more high-profile things we've done, uh, adding seats above the Green Monster, seats above the right field roof, creating the premium sections uh, in the suite level, the EMC club, uh, the State Street pavilion level. Fenway never uh, had an upper deck. It still doesn't. We don't call it an upper deck. We just call it the State Street pavilion level. Uh, given uh, Fenway's uh, geometry, you're still very close 
close to the field and, and you have uh, a ballpark less than 40,000 seats. We're 37,673 fixed seats. We sell about another 1,700 standing room. We want to keep Fenway as small and intimate as possible, uh, but, but make uh, it a little bit more modern, offering some premium offerings, better food, um, better uh, events uh, each and every year uh, to drive new and different people to the ballpark. So we're about 325 million in, and I think uh, we'll, we'll keep investing year in and year out uh, as long as there's a, a return on those investments. Uh, ownership has been willing to do that. Finally, the, the last thing we think about uh, in addition to winning and the ballpark experience, improving, enhancing Fenway Park, um, is to be active participants in the, the New England uh, community. This is something that uh, was driven by John and Tom when we arrived. Uh, obviously, when, you, uh, when much is given to you, much is uh, expected uh, in return. Um, and we established the Red Sox Foundation uh, back in 2002 uh, to work hard to try and improve the lives uh, of kids throughout New England uh, and veterans uh, throughout New England. And so just a few um, notes on, on what we focus on with our foundation and our charitable activities. Um, everyone's familiar with the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and the six decade plus uh, relationship we've had with the Jimmy Fund. It's probably the most recognizable relationship in all professional sports, um, but they, we, they are literally saving lives and we're proud to be uh, one of their uh, largest partners uh, through the fundraising activities associated with the Pan Mass Challenge, uh, our telethon drive each and every year, uh, and it's a very, uh, it's not a, a professional relationship, it's a personal relationship for all of us, uh, and it's very important. In addition to that, we have a scholars program uh, where we pick out 25 kids uh, each and every year and identify them in middle school uh, to come up with um, kids who are achieving academically but may need some financial support to go on uh, to college. Um, we have a recreation program through Ron Burton's Training Village out in Central Mass, uh, and a relatively new, it's now 10 years old, but in our world, that's relatively new uh, program called the Home Base Program, uh, which is a clinic uh, that we built in partnership with Mass General Hospital uh, that treats veterans, uh, men and women coming back from the war that are dealing with the invisible wounds of war, post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury. Um, and this is, a, a, many of you probably know this, an ec epidemic in our country. Uh, and we're trying to encourage these folks to come to the clinic at home base uh, and get treatment and they're seeing real results. And so we've been raising a lot of money for that through the Red Sox Foundation uh, over these past 10 years. Uh, all told, there's been about $95 million in in-kind in grants, donations, um, and it's, uh, it's growing fast. We just hired a new executive director. She, she joins us January 2nd uh, to sort of build a strategic plan. The, we look at the first 15 years, you know, what's, what's next over the next 15 years? So we're gonna double down on our commitment to the community, uh, and that's something that's uh, really important to us. So my last uh, slide before we get into the um, uh, talk radio uh, section of this uh, presentation uh, is, how, well, how do we do this? Um, well, it's probably the way you guys run all of your businesses. I know it's the way the Sea Dogs operate. Uh, we like to uh, tell people, and, and we try to behave this way, we try to be in the yes business. Um, we try to say yes to our employees, our customers, our players, their families, our broadcast partners, our partners at Major League Baseball, our affiliates. Uh, it's easy to say no, um, especially when you have a, a high profile brand uh, where you know, you're fortunate to have a great fan base, uh, but you surprise people when your first reaction is, yes, we, we can figure that out. We can build a relationship and, and work on this together. Uh, so we like to say that we're in the yes business, and that helped, we started that in 2002, um, and it really started with the notion that we could actually win uh, and win a World Series championship and, and get positive thinking going through uh, everyone's minds as opposed to negative thinking. Uh, and if you focus on the mindset of, of winning, uh, you, you will ultimately get there. It takes a lot of luck um, and hard work, uh, but we, we want to be in the yes business. We value that uh, above everything else because uh, that allows you to establish these sort of real, meaningful, authentic uh, relationships with your customers, with your employees, uh, and with the people that you do business with uh, throughout New England and throughout Major League Baseball. Um, so I just mentioned that as perhaps a segue uh, to getting into the yes business to 
answering your questions. Um, if anyone is uh, bold enough, I'd ask uh, Carter and Jamie, which people are racing to the microphone, uh, we'll see how, how smart the, uh, the audience is here. Um, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have uh, related to uh, any topic with the Red Sox or some of the other businesses that we're in. Maybe we'll go, we'll start over on this side of the room. There we go. Yes, okay. ma'am, if you would tell us your name and, and where you're from and then your uh, question. My name is Felicia Knight. I'm with the Knight Canny Group, and I really don't need a keychain. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I want to give you the opportunity to say yes. Say yes that Andrew Benintendi has a long future ahead of him <laughs> at the Boston Red Sox, and he will not be traded for Jose Abreu. <laughs> I, I love uh, commentary and suggestions. I really do, more than questions. So that's well, a great one. Give, you know what, Carter? Give her the whole gift bag. Uh, let's just wrap this one up. That was a great, great comment. Uh, Andrew Benintendi, um, former, former Portland Sea Dog, yes. um, it has, has been uh, incredible. In fact, Bill and I were talking about him last night at dinner. Um, you know, I, I've not spent my, what, what, did, what did you get her, Carter? What, what did he give you there? And Andrew Benintendi All signed right. baseball. <laughs> He's good. He's good. See, we're. I, I may not hear whatever you say next, but. <laughs> this, this is not a setup, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. This is, we did not plan this out. We've never met, right? All right. You're my favorite person. <laughs> Thank you for the comment. I will pass it along to Andrew Benintendi, the man with the with the perfect swing. <laughs> and maybe should we just go to the middle here? Yes. Oh, you, you want to know if we're going to trade Andrew Benintendi for Jose Abreu? Ne next question. <laughs> no, no, I, I, would be, I, would be, uh, I would be surprised uh, to see us part ways uh, with any of our young players. That said, sometimes you do have to give to get, uh, but we have uh, had a track record over the last 12 years 18 months of trading away um, some prospects, uh, if we're being brutally honest and frank. So the goal is to now ferociously protect the young talent in the organization, uh, especially those who are contributing at the major league level. So you never know. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to uh, be on record as saying that it would never happen, uh, but I would, I would frankly be surprised uh, to see um, some talent off the major league level uh, be dealt in this offseason, unless there was a really, really good baseball reason for it. But um, like you, I, I hope Andrew Benintendi is with us for a long, long time. Uh, and the only person that feels more strongly about that is, is my father. So we, I think we're all in, the, in agreement. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm, I'm Steve East, uh, uh, Steve Musica with Lean East Business Process Improvement. And uh, I'm, I'm a kid who grew up in the 80s watching Wade Boggs and like checking his stats every night to see how he was doing. And I think it helped me get into Lean Six Sigma in the future. Uh, but with the whole Moneyball era, I've sort of, sort of lost touch with all the statistics now. So if you had to pick one statistic for like maybe hitting and pitching that you could use or had to use, what would that statistic be now? Well, the, the one I would pick wouldn't be related to hitting or pitching, um, but I, I think it would, be, it would be wins and losses. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, all the, the analytics that, that you use on the baseball side uh, or on the baseball, uh, business or baseball side, uh, we actually use uh, analytics in our uh, fundraising and in our foundation uh, as well. That's sort of one tool in the toolbox. Um, but you really need to focus, I think, in, in my role uh, and, and with ownership, you need to look at sort of the greater good and the overall performance of your, uh, the assets, whether it's that port, uh, Fenway Sports Group portfolio of assets. Um, and when it comes to the Red Sox, uh, wins and losses really rise above anything else. Uh, I remember when we were in San Diego, uh, the use of data and information was really uh, nothing new. Um, there was another Epstein, uh, Eddie Epstein, that worked for us at the San Diego Padres, who uh, was really advanced at using uh, analytics to study uh, different defensive metrics, uh, looking at different offensive statistics. Um, so I guess I'd probably say 
Um, on base percentage is something that you know is is really really important. You've got to get guys on base and move them along. If you look at strikeout rates now compared to just two three years ago, you'd think we were playing a totally different game. Uh, and some some uh, foreign data had come in from some other sport just because of the change. So the game, uh, it, from a statistical perspective, has changed a lot. Um, and I think. Analytics are important, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not an, an inefficiency anymore in the market the way it was from, say, 1995 to 2003 or 4. Every front office has a, a data and analytics group that they're, they're using to try and get a competitive advantage. So therefore, it's not that much of a competitive advantage the way it was uh, many years ago. And let's face it, when we had our success in 2002, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, and when Theo was our general manager, um, using analytics was, was important, but let's not forget, we also uh, were able to play in the free agency market, and we had uh, players like Manny Ramirez and, and Kurt Schilling and went out and got Keith Folk, and so we used uh, data and information. We also used dollars uh, to construct a major league roster that had success in October, so you need to use uh, both, uh, and I think that's, that's really important. Uh, ben Sherrington believed in that as well. Uh, you can see how Theo's operated in Chicago. He's uh, used both to construct a World Series champion. Um, and Dave Dombrowski, in his 40 years, uh, has used both. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. I think we do, uh, as an industry, tend to sort of, sometimes we lean too far towards the use of data and information and not good old-fashioned scouting and, and gut instincts. And uh, we, we try to do the, use the best of both worlds to make uh, informed decisions. But it's it's hard, I'll tell you, to project the future performance of a baseball player. Another thing we were talking about at dinner last night was, you know, how do you how do you project uh, Rafi Devers? A lot of us uh, thought that it might have been a quick move to come up, you know, from Portland to Boston and, and do what he's done. Well, now let's let's see what he does next year. Does the league adjust to him? Uh, does he revert back a little bit in the sophomore year? You know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, but baseball is really really hard to predict future performance uh, because of the mental aspect of the game. Uh, so thank you very much for your question. Uh, that's a very, very thank fair you. question. It didn't involve ticket prices at all. So Carter, let's get him a nice uh, gift and then we'll move over to this side of the room. Good morning. I'm Kristen Farnham. I'm VP of Development at Spurwink. Uh, my husband, Bob, who like you, is a Trinity Bantam. He, right. a few years ago. All right, time out. She wants the whole bag too. <laughs> <laughs> He had the opportunity a few years ago to play on the ice at Fenway uh -huh. with his high school hockey team, which was really thrilling. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about how you decide what events to do at the park in the off season and how they contribute to either baseball operations or audience development. Great, great question. And you brought up uh, one of my uh, favorite subjects, which is frozen Fenway. Uh, so Carter, please give her a very nice uh, gift <laughs> from the back of the room there. Um, the, the, the real uh, goal of um, non-baseball events at Fenway uh, is to drive activity, life, energy. Yes, dollars. We, we are able to generate some money from these events. Um, and it's also money that is not subject to Major League Baseball's revenue sharing system because dollars uh, that are not related to uh, your tickets or sponsorships or broadcasts or concessions and merch um, are not shared by the, the league. Um, but the dollars that we're, we generate from these events um, are dwarfed by our, our baseball revenues, obviously. So the real reason is to drive life and energy uh, in the months of November, December, January, February, March, when Fenway used to be dark and quiet and almost like a cut-through neighborhood when you were going from the Longwood Medical District to Back Bay or downtown. Now Fenway is full of, of life and energy. There's uh, residential development, retail, mixed use. So what we've been trying to do is work with the city to create Fenway as this entertainment zone. Um, and we really, uh, I think, were, were, put, were put on the map when we were able to pull off the National Hockey League's Winter Classic uh, deal that we made with the Bruins and the Flyers and the, and the NHL. Um, and the degree of difficulty of building an outdoor rink. Who, I, I, you, you guys are from Maine, so maybe you knew this, but the temperature can't be too warm. It can't be too cold. 
Uh, you don't want the sun out. You certainly don't want rain. So you need like the perfect conditions to build outdoor ice. We had a crew of people working for three weeks, 24-7, uh, to keep that ice going. Uh, and so we made the deal with the NHL, and then we thought to ourselves, geez, we have a lot of hockey fans in the front office. We got to do more with this. It, it would be a shame to just set this rink up, have it be there in the middle of the ballpark for 12 hours and then take it down. Let's, let's use it. Let's put it to use. So the uh, first call we made was to Joe Bertania, who's the commissioner of Hockey East, um, the conference that UMaine plays in. Uh, and we, yeah, all right, UMaine. Um, and in fact, I have a great UMaine story um, about one of the frozen Fenways. I think it was the third or fourth time we did it. Uh, we had heavy rains, and Bertania called me down to the office. He said, look, we need an independent third party to make a decision on what we're going to do with this game. And I said, yeah, so why are you calling me? He said, you're it. You're the third party. <laughs> so I went down to the Red Sox uh, clubhouse, which is where uh, UMaine was dressing, and um, Coach Red Gendron, I don't know if anyone knows Red Gendron, raise your hand if you know Red. Uh, he is not a guy that you want to walk into in the middle of the first period of a hockey game where it's raining uh, and tell him that, yeah, I think you should keep playing, because uh, that was the decision we came up with. The BU coach was fine with it. Uh, Red wasn't too happy with us that day, uh, but it was a lot of fun, and we've tried to expand on Frozen Fenway. We've got high school games, middle school games, uh, girls programs, men's leagues, women's leagues, corporate leagues, and just try and think of the things that we would like to do uh, when we were kids. And we're all in this business because we're fans. So whether it's skiing or soccer or concerts, Fenway's always been a great gathering place. If you go back 100 years in history, uh, you'll see that there were political uh, conventions at Fenway. The Pope came to Fenway. Uh, Irish politicians came to Fenway. There was even wrestling matches at Fenway. The Patriots played there uh, in the 1960s. So it's always been this, this great community gathering place. Uh, so we've just tried to uh, continue to enhance that. And with the improvements and renovations and, and the winterization of the ballpark, we've been able to do more and more. So thank you very much for that uh, question. We'll go back uh, right here in the middle. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Paula Mahoney from Words at Work. Um, and in my house, we call Andrew Cutie Patootie. <laughs> How do you um, spell that? I'm going <laughs> to. I have a hashtag. <laughs> my, favorite, um, my favorite Fenway week um, in 2016 was when I saw the team win twice, and then I saw the Grateful Dead and Paul McCartney. Wow. Um, in it's a good back week. to back to back. Yeah, it was a great a good week. week. Um, so I love the way you're diversifying the mix at Fenway. Um, I'm con a little concerned when I uh, watch games because I'm a diehard and, you know, it doesn't matter if the team's winning or losing. They're winners to me. Um, uh, but I look at other ballparks, and they're not selling out the way Fenway does. Um, so what are the other teams doing, and how are the Red Sox helping other teams that don't have the fan base that we have here? Great question, and uh, thank you for your, your comments about uh, the diversification and things we're doing. Um, look, we're, we're blessed with 14 million roughly people in New England um, that have grown up with the Red Sox in their blood uh, with a diehard, passionate fan base, uh, uh, hardworking, dedicated sometimes snarky and angry media core uh, that covers us day in and day out. Uh, you can't create that. Um, so when it comes to the other clubs, you, know, you, you asked a great question. How are the other clubs marketing the team or, or, or how are they going to be able to sell out their games night in and night out? Uh, it's not that easy. In fact, when I was a, an intern for the Yankees back in 1993, I was all excited. It was my first day. I was assigned to the ticket office. The head of the ticket office, Frank Swain, 75-year-old guy, said to me, so, you know, what do you want to do, kid? What do you want to do in baseball? I said, oh, geez, I really, I think I'd like to be in the marketing area. He said, marketing. Let, let me take you out. Let me show you something. I'll show you where the marketing department is. And walked me out of the ticket office and took me down right behind the first base dugout. And the Yankees were taking batting practice. He said, see that right out there? I said, I was blown away. I said, oh my God, there are the players right there. This is amazing. He said, that's the marketing department. He said, that's our product. You know, marketing is, is really important, uh, but as the team goes, 
we go. That's why I led by saying a winning competitive product is really what we have to be all about. So then we can aggressively market uh, the product. And we're blessed with you know, decades and decades of history, tradition, um, a great franchise with 14 million uh, fans in our market. And then we have the diaspora around the country, right? So many people come from other parts of, of uh, the country, the world, to Boston for college and university. And that's a time when you're impressionable. You come to Fenway. Hopefully, you fall in love with Fenway. And then you stay a fan if you move to California or Chicago or Dallas or what have you. Uh, so it's really difficult to, to recreate that. Um, I will tell you that baseball, you, you just because you asked about some of the other clubs, um, we have a real opportunity right now. We're coming off of two of the most um, high-profile, exciting, well-played World Series uh, games. Uh, we have um, young stars in the game. Uh, our attendance, uh, our revenues in the industry, um, the interest from the national broadcasters uh, is as high as it's ever been. There's, there was a, you know, a lot of reports two, three years ago Go, the baseball is on the decline. Uh, for the first time in 2016, uh, our participation in the sport at the youth level, baseball and softball was up over the prior year, about 22 and a half million kids playing baseball and softball. People talk a lot about lacrosse and it's a great sport, uh, but we dwarf lacrosse in terms of participation. And some of the other sports are, as you know, face real challenges. So I think we have an opportunity uh, to step on the gas pedal and really uh, take baseball to the next level. We do have issues. We need to address the pace of play. Uh, we need to think about ways to improve the product, these incessant mound visits. Maybe we install a, a pitch clock like we have at the minor league level that's working so well. Uh, Commissioner Rob Manfred uh, knows that. He gets that. I think you're going to see him be very aggressive with respect to rule changes that are going to help improve that product so that the ballparks around the country uh, become uh, full night in and night out. But all that said, we had about 72 million people attend uh, baseball games, uh, major league, that's just major league baseball games, not to mention the millions and millions of others who went to minor league games. So that's more than all the other major sports combined. Uh, so we're really well positioned uh, in terms of the future of baseball, but we have to treasure it because if you don't treasure it and you don't make rule changes and you don't adjust uh, to the world, uh, you, sports can fade and go away in society. You've seen that happen to boxing, for example. You've seen that happen to horse racing. So we need to treasure this, this love for baseball that we have and make sure that we do everything we can to treat it with tender, loving care. So great question. Hope she gets a gift. It's hard to see out there. You got a winter hat. Okay, great. Yes, ma'am, over here. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, just want to say we have time for one more question. All right, let's make it a good one. All right. No keychains. Nancy Murray, Maine Medical Center. I hope this isn't a keychain uh, <laughs> question. Um, you mentioned that you started in New York, went to San Diego, now here in Boston. Um, I know the media has a, the Boston media or the New England media has a reputation for being really tough. Um, love to hear your perspective on whether or not that's the case and how you as an organization manage through that. Great question, and it's definitely not a keychain question. That's a nice, uh, it's a good question. I don't know if it's a nice question. It's a good question. Um, we, we've um, uh, discussed this a little bit on the radio uh, this morning here. First and foremost, I, I guess my perspective is, is biased because I grew up here. Um, I grew up in, in Boston. I uh, grew up literally a mile from Fenway. I've only known uh, Boston media personalities. So I think you have to think about where the context, where, where, where are these media folks coming from? Well, they're representing the most passionate fan base uh, in all sports. I work for the Padres, I work for the Yankees, I work for the Hartford Whalers, uh, work for some other sports uh, teams. You don't find the passion uh, anywhere else that we have here in Boston, including New York. And that may be controversial to say, but there's so many other things going on in New York. If the Yankees win or lose, that does not affect the mood of the city the way the Red Sox winning or losing affects our mood day in and day out. Uh, so it, it sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but the fact that we have tough, sometimes brutal, 
uh, media uh, in examining and questioning and second guessing every single move uh, is actually a very, very good thing uh, because it means people care and they want to know what's going on and they're interested in, in the team. The worst thing that can infect your organization or your franchise uh, is apathy. Uh, and you've seen that happen in some other markets. I won't name names, but some organizations that have great success in baseball, um, and then they can't sell out home playoff games because people are waiting for the next round. That's, that's, uh, that's a scary thing. So we don't ever want uh, apathy. So the first thing I think about when I think about the media is the fact that it's important that you have this really uh, uh, aggressive uh, coverage. When we go on the road, we'll have 12, 15 beat writers. Uh, when some other clubs will come in uh, to town from other markets, they may have one or two. So we would have killed for the kind of coverage that we get in Boston when we were with the San Diego Padres. So that's really important. And then the second thing is, um, if, if you build real, authentic, genuine relationships with the members of the media, you can at least have a conversation uh, with them and explain your side of the story, uh, build trust. Uh, and it, it is hard, um, but you have to think about it. They're, they're not, uh, if they're writing things that aren't true, um, then you have, you have a real right to get upset. But if they're writing things that are true and they have an opinion, that's their job, right? So columnists, um, talk radio, show hosts, far, far be it from me to defend them, uh, but I understand a little bit about the media business because in the end of the day, we're really in the same business. We're providing content, we're providing live content for people to enjoy, escape the realities of their day-to-day -day life. The media business is trying to do the same thing, um, but the media business is, is going through a period of time where they've been totally disrupted uh, by technology. And the media platforms, whether it's cable television, over-the-air television, radio, terrestrial radio, satellite radio, over-the-air TV, cable TV, they're trying to figure out how they're going to keep this model together. It's largely supported by advertising and subscribers, as we know. Uh, and to get advertisers and subscribers, you need to get an audience and ratings. Um, and what we've seen, fortunately or unfortunately, especially over the last 24 months, uh, is the more sort of sensational, outlandish things that get said, um, ratings go up. Uh, and so that's just a, a fact of life that we're, we're living in in 2017. Uh, and, and so that applies to sports. The more sort of controversial and um, sensational a story can become, it's gonna drive an audience, it's gonna drive viewership, which is gonna drive ad revenue uh, and allow that media content, that media platform to survive and exist. So we recognize that. Um, and uh, the third thing I would say is uh, driving in in the morning, uh, I just try to listen to country radio. <laughs> That's the best way to deal with it. So thank you very much, I appreciate it. It's a great group. And I'll say one, one last thing. Um, this is the, the group in the city of Portland and probably the state of Maine, uh, the key movers and shakers. Please support the Portland Sea Dogs. Buy tickets, buy sponsorships, uh, and please know that your support of the Sea Dogs is so appreciated, not just by Sea Dogs management and ownership, but by the Red Sox, because you'll look out there on the field opening day and you'll see uh, a ton of Sea Dog alums at Fenway Park. And so we thank you very much for that. Thanks, guys. Uh, thank you, Sam, for uh, just a, a fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming today, and in appreciation, Sam, we're going to make a donation in your name to the Portland Masonic. Uh, as always, you can stay up to date uh, by connecting with the Chamber via Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter, and stay tuned to the Chamber's website for a video of this morning's presentation. Next month, we'll be welcoming Danielle Conway, the uh, Dean of the Law School here in Portland, and uh, that's gonna be a, a fantastic presentation. And on behalf of myself uh, and the chamber, I wanna wish every one of you a wonderful, happy, uh, and, and uh, fulfilling holiday season, and uh, all the best for the rest of 2017 and looking forward to the future of 2018. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you.